What is a better way of thinking about God? That's what we're going to talk about today. God never hurries. There are no deadlines against which he must work. Only to know this is to quiet our spirit and relax our nerves. A.W. Tozer Today we're going to continue our conversation about the book, Your God is Too Small, by J.B. Phillips, a guide for believers and skeptics alike. We talked last time about the wrong ways that people imagine God. And this book being kind of older, I thought it was really wise, even though our world is a little bit different than it was in 1953. I think there are other ways that people think about God that we didn't talk about last time. Sometimes people think of God as a vending machine where I ask him a prayer and he just gives me whatever I want, like he was of some kind of Santa Claus. We could go on all day about the wrong images people have about God. And I wonder too, is that why people go through eighth grade Sunday school, and then they walk away because they have this image of God and it never matures. They never really understand that what they learned in eighth grade needs to grow, needs to expand, needs to go on. And so they learn these stories about the Bible and these messages of God and the basics about Christianity, and they never go any further. And so then they get to be adults and they're like, well, it's really silly, or I don't believe that. And I don't even know that they don't know what to believe in general. And now we're in this situation, someone was telling me, that kids are growing up with parents that don't believe in God, so they don't know the first thing about God at all. And so when you tell them something, they seem a little surprised. That's what Jesus meant? That's what Jesus meant. That's why this happened. Oh, so now people don't even have an image of God when they think about God because they just never were exposed to it as children. They never were taught anything about it because their parents didn't believe. So this part of the book, we're going to talk about some more constructive ways to think about God. And he said, it's hard for us at times to see the size of God, that he is so magnificent. He is so large. He called him that God is not focused. I think nowadays the, the, that phrase means something a little bit different. But what he means is, is that he isn't this little point of light we see. He is the whole universe. He is everything that was built in it. He is every law of physics, every circle of life with bugs being eaten by birds and birds being eaten by animals. He he has the entire structure of the world. And his vision is not just this tiny point. It is the size of the universe. And yet it's interesting because a God who is the size of the universe, who is the creator of everything, still cares about each of us as individuals, not even as people. I love my people, you know, and he is making sure people stay okay. He is interested in each individual personalized version of us. God said, you know, I knew you in your mother's womb. And so God is bigger than what we can imagine. And so when we worship God, And if we're not thinking of them in this large, universal sense, we're missing out on the real fullness of everything God can offer. He is huge. He is the size of the universe and cannot be contained by science, by knowledge, by encyclopedias, by books, by psychology, or by whatever conception we can come up with of him. We have to understand he is bigger than anything we could possibly think of. Making sure that we understand how immense God is gives us a sense of awe that he cares about little old me, even though he is the size of the universe. He says even sometimes we try to figure out, is God solid material? Is he spiritual material? I think in that case too, God obviously was resurrected in solidness in human form in the body, but God is everything. (laughs) Solid, not solid, spiritual matter, everything. And so try not to put them up in little tiny boxes, but consider the everything that he is. And when we think about God, we can go ahead and answer, what kind of person is God being? What kind of being person that it is? And he is someone who loves truth, goodness, and beauty. That God is the Father, the the Creator. We we talked about when we talked about all the different names for God, the the God that rumbles the mountains, the God that created everything in it. But 
when we think about Christ, we don't think about him as the father, but because they are all one and separate in the Trinity, he is also the father. He is also the creator. And he, again, came down to die for us. So trying to, again, put him into this box of actors, you know, like he, God is in this role. We know what kind of person he is. He is loving, curious. I think he's humorous. You know, that's, a, that's kind of the message I'm getting for it, too. He is interested in us participating in his plans. He is, it says, invisible, unchanging, but visible and variable is all the things that we can possibly imagine. He's also our friend. You know, we talk about what a friend I have in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That it can be all of these things all at the same time. And we love to put things in boxes because we want to categorize things, right? That's a good loaf of bread. This is a good dinner meal. I like this movie. I don't like that book. And we, we want to put everything into a category. But it's so important when we're trying to label God that we don't restrict God to something he is just so far beyond. He says exalted that it, it just isn't working in that. And then the important question he says comes then too is if God is everything with love, purity, the power of forgiveness, the power of love, all the things that we know Jesus to be, why is this world so screwed up? And he said that we have to first understand that sin is re us refusing to follow God and refusing to do the things that God has asked us to do. I always kind of put it in terms of God invented us. And so he wrote the uh, technical manual for us. He wrote the owner's manual for us. And so he knows the best ways we work, the best ways we love, the best ways we function. And we think by our sinning, it hurts God, and it does. But I think what hurts God about our sin is not what it does to him. It is what it does to us. Oh, man, is Jill throwing her life away again? Is Jill falling into that same rut she keeps? Oh, man, I love Jill, and I don't want her to fall into these ruts. As the person who invented us, he wants us to have that understanding that he knows us better than anyone. And out of his heart and out of his love, he wants us to follow him and, and move away from sin because it's destructive to us. You know, sometimes atheists will talk about, oh, God's petty. Follow my rules or I don't love you. That's not it at all. First of all, God says, I'll love you no matter what. But he wants us to follow these rules because he knows it's best for what we need to do. We may say, you know what? I don't think so. I think gambling is the best thing for me and I'm going to keep doing it. And God would say, no, Jill, it's not helping you. It's not helping your family. It's not helping the people around you. It is making you focused on something that is destroying you. And so he wants us to escape sin, not for his well-being, but for our well-being. And so he does want us to get away from self-destruction, self-love, and instead focus on him who will lead us down that right path. And he says in the end, what kind of person then, if we understand the immensity of God, what does God want me to be? And he thinks it's rounded up, and I agree with him, in the Beatitudes. Blessed means to be happy. And someone described it as, if your life was perfect, you were in the place that makes you the happiest place in the world, that is blessed. And so when you say the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are the this and the that, think of happy. And he says that most people think, and I thought this was an interesting way of putting it, quote, happy are the pushers, for they get on in this world. Happy are the hard-boiled, because for they never let life hurt them. Happy are they who complain, for they get their own way in the end. Happy are the blasé, for they never have to worry about their own sin. Happy are the slave drivers, because they get results. Happy are the knowledgeable men of this world, for they know their way around. And happy are the troublemakers, because have to take notice of them. That's our Beatitudes. But instead, he comes up with his own translation, I guess, of the Beatitudes, trying to get at the core of them. Happy are those who realize their spiritual poverty, for they have already entered the kingdom of reality. 
Happy are those who bear their share of the world's pain. In the long run, they will know more happiness than those who avoid it. Happy are those who accept life and their own limitations. They will find more in life than anybody. Happy are those who long to truly be good. They will fully realize their ambition. Happy are those who are ready to make allowances and to forgive. They will know the love of God. Happy are those who are real in their thoughts and feelings. In the end, they will see the ultimate reality of God. And happy are those who help others to live together. They will be known to be doing God's work. This is what God wants from us. He wants us to live in reality, in love, in being excited, being constructive, he says, and happy. These things will make us happy. It was interesting. A friend of mine asked me once, does God want us to be happy? And I don't think that that's the right question because people will say, well, to me, being happy is sleeping around. Me being happy is eating everything I want the moment I want it. Me being happy is my gambling addiction. We think of ourselves as happy in those situations. And if the answer is, does God want me to sin so that I can be happy? The answer, of course, is no. When you follow Jesus, when you take up his cross, when you exclude the power of evil in your life, you will become happy because that is the true meaning of what love, compassion, mercy is. And then you become happy. I talked about when I became a Christian, I don't think I became a different person. I really wasn't doing things that would cause me to turn around in the way that sometimes people were. I didn't have gambling habits. I wasn't going around and sleeping around in college. I was focused on my schoolwork. But the turning around part was about focusing on God. You wouldn't have looked at my actions in the same sense and say, wow, Jill really turned around. But to look at my heart and the fact that I have spent these years aligning myself with God, I have become happier and happier and happier because now I'm seeking to follow him in ways that I didn't definitely when I wasn't a Christian, but even when I was an early believer, a young believer. And now the more I go after this focus on Christ, the more my life becomes happy. And maybe when people look at that, they would say, well, Jill lives a very simple life. Jill doesn't really do things that would make a person happy, but they don't really understand this is happy. This is what happy feels like to to try to live out what Christ wants for us. We don't want to have this artificial guilt, you know, that God is out there trying to create, he says, standards and taboos, make us feel guilty about things, that we need to be not concerned also with comparison, perfectionism. We're not trying to compare ourselves to everyone else in the world. We are trying to follow Christ in the way that we are made. In our uniqueness, I mean, we have things that are common to all mankind, but we are also unique in how God made us. We are a jumble of our own DNA, our own upbringing, the parents we have, the experiences we have. And God is not expecting for us, he says, to toe the line. He's not walking around disappointed in us. Oh, when's Jill going to get her act together? He is not trying to do this Pharisee type judgment on us. Instead, he is hoping that we fall in line with him so that we have the best life, that we have the most fulfilled life living in Christ. And he says that we're not supposed to walk around feeling like we're guilty, disobedient. He says a true adult has that sense of sin and guilt and shame when we're in contact with the real God. But I think it doesn't end there. Instead, We're not going to be proud of the things we do, but instead we're going to try to fix things, realign ourselves back with God. And we're never going to do it perfectly, but we're going to keep trying. We're going to still try to build that bridge with God, follow him. We're not going to be uncorrectable. We're not going to be arrogant about it. We're not going to be proud or boastful about the things we're doing. 
But instead, we're going to take up that fight that Christ has with evil. It always says that our war is with the powers and principalities of evil, right? When we get away from self-love and sin and focus on God, and that is going to align us back up again. We're never going to get that moral perfection, but we are going to start walking, following him in the right path. Make this clear, we're not doing this to earn our own salvation. We are doing this so that we understand that Jesus died for us, that he loves us. He wrote our owner's manual, and the more we align ourselves with him, we're not saving ourselves. We're saving ourselves trouble, pain, arrogance, hardships in life, because we are starting to live the life that Jesus has asked us to live. And so then he asked the question, you know, what changed with the early disciples that when we read the Gospels, we understand that they had screwed up so many times. You had Peter being boastful at the wrong time, saying the wrong things here and there, falling away, running away when Jesus was put to the cross. They were weak individuals. And then something happened to them when they saw the resurrected Christ. I think of it too, because we're doing Acts right now in the Bible in small steps. When Paul saw the risen Lord, even though it was mere moments, he was fully educated on what he had to do. It, he didn't walk around in the desert for three and a half years with Jesus like the other apostles did. He knew exactly what he needed to do. That experience of seeing God in his resurrection, the honest truth of what God is, realigned everything about them. This wasn't hysteria. It wasn't some sort of illusion. It wasn't a bunch of people running around in the desert saying, we saw God and we know who he is. It were people who were changed and, in fact, changed so much that they walked to their deaths with these same beliefs. And even as they were changed and they were focused on God and the apostles' lives were changed and then the scripture were written down so that we could believe too, think of it. There's so many people yet today who believe that Christ is not only risen from the dead, but is alive to this day, cares about us to this very day. And knowing that Christ is true, we must admit he is living with us in perfect harmony, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and knows the pain and suffering we're going through, but also the love. that I always love that passage that we love because Christ loved us first. His love taught us how to love. And it is not natural, I think, to love. People say, oh, well, na altruism, love, compassion, the family structure was all just organically built through the evolution of culture. And I don't think so. You could say people do pretty well when they take advantage of each other, when they're committing crimes against each other, when they take what other people have. This truth we have in us that God had died for our sins causes us to want to love others, to love others in a way that is divine. And the only reason we know how to do it is because God taught us to do this very thing. And even where people don't believe that Christ is alive, we live our lives as if it's true because we know morality, we know caring for each other, and all of that comes from Jesus. And it's instantaneous, too. When something hard hits people, the thing will, people will say, is, oh, God, help me. It's the first thing that comes to people's minds. And so that reinforcement of Jesus being alive today and caring for us is apparent because we call out to him. Many people do, whether they believe in him or not. It's natural inside of our souls. And so then the next part is if God did die, rose, and is living today, that's when we say, can we do the will of God? Can we accept what God has asked for us to do? And in the end, that's what it is. He abolished death. We're expecting to go to heaven and be with him, that he transferred this guilt of everything that we've ever done. And if you say, well, I don't sin. <laughs> You're not looking at it the right way. Of course, we've sinned. We've said things that we shouldn't have said. We've hurt people in ways we shouldn't have hurt them. And Christ says, you know, I'm here to forgive it all. He comes to bring men 
not merely life, but life of a deeper and more enduring quality. God tries to give us that life of love and truth, and we would not have it without him. So when we look at God the wrong way in these trite ways that we mentioned last week, these inappropriate ways, and instead of looking at him as the immense God who loves, who created everything, who is as big as the universe, but focused on us as individuals, and all it can do is then put our existence into perspective, that we are loved human beings, not loved anymore, not loved any less than the person standing next to us. That person, too, is a loved human being. And what we can do is show each other that compassion. And once we understand God as a person, we can also then focus on him, the sacrifice he made, and the human being Jesus Christ was. He says, quote, If we accept as fact, as the fact of history, it is becoming possible to find a satisfactory and comprehensive answer to the great many problems and what is equally important, a reasonable shelf on which the unsolved perplexities may be left in confidence. We don't have to know everything. We don't have to grasp everything once we understand the fact of Jesus Christ he has for us and the way he has asked us to walk in that love. There are many things then at that point. I agree. We can put on that shelf. We don't have to have our selfishness, our sinfulness, our pride, our arrogance, our fear, and our worry. Again, I always say I'm the pan millennialist. I think in the end, this all pans out. I didn't get that from me. I got that because God told us in the end, this all pans out. And I trust and have faith in that. And so once you have that, we can put all the things on that shelf that has infected us, has left us powerless, has left us fearful, the evil things of this world, and instead take up the good, the mighty, the loving things to do and walk in that way. Jesus kept saying it when he was talking in the Gospels, follow me. And that's in the end what we can do once we put all these other things on the shelf and follow him, the God and all his immensity, all his love and all his care for us. So my challenge to you is last time we talked about thinking about God in the ways that are hard or maybe the wrong ways we think about God. But what are some true images you do have of God that are backed up by the scripture, backed up by the actions of Jesus and give you hope? that you can take these things that are just wrong for us and put them on a shelf and leave them there so that we can go ahead and just say, you know what? They're unsolved perplexities. And now you can go out in your life and have confidence. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear about topics, questions you have, how this podcast is going. Did you read any of these books? Did you think something of them? I'd love to hear from you. And remember, our walk to looking at God in the most true way starts with small steps because he is so large beside you.